All right, you guys, we've made it to our last and final lecture on covalent bonding or in our covalent bonding unit. So congratulations. Here we go. Now that we know that molecules can be polar or nonpolar, we are going to be able to then determine what types of interactive forces exist between molecules. Now, before we get into all of those different types of forces, let's first define what we mean by an intramolecular force versus an intermolecular force. Now, if you see this prefix here, intra, this prefix intra means within. So what, when we're talking about intramolecular forces, we're talking about the force of attraction within a molecule or on the inside of a molecule. This is the force that holds atoms together to form compounds. These are the bonds themselves. Like an ionic, this is the ionic bond or the covalent bond. This is the force that holds those individual atoms together, holding one atom towards another atom, the bond itself. Intermolecular forces, the prefix inter means between. Like think about if you have good interpersonal skills, you're good at interacting between people. So an intermolecular force is a force of attraction between molecules. A force that holds one molecule near another molecule. Like what is the force that keeps this molecule near a neighboring molecule in a sample? Like, is there an attraction between molecules? Okay, so this is between molecules versus this, which is between atoms. Now, these intermolecular forces between the molecules, these forces determine properties. A whole wide array, a array. <laughs> I was going to say like a various array of properties. Instead, I said array, I think, or a wide array. Who knows what I was trying to say? Anyway, what are some of these properties? Um, we're going to talk more about these properties in AP Chemistry, but for now, I'll just introduce you to some of the vocabulary. Vapor pressure. Melting point. And boiling point. And solubility. So we're going to look at how these intermolecular forces affect these properties next year. But for now, I want you guys to just be familiar with what these three different forces of attraction are. OK, so we're going to start with dispersion forces. And in the chart, um, in your packet, we're going to talk about, we're going to do a description, a diagram, talk about which substances experience these forces, and how strong are they. Now, I know in your notes, um, we start with a description and then go to a diagram, but I actually think I'm going to start with a diagram and then go to a description, if that's OK. OK, so a dispersion force, actually, I lied. I can do a description first. A dispersion force is an attraction between temporary induced 
dipoles in molecules. And you're like, oh my God, Mr. Vera, what does that even mean? An attraction between temporary, comma, induced dipoles and molecules. Well, let's think about what all of that means. Let's say we have um, hydrogen, right? We know hydrogen is H2, okay? So that's going to be a hydrogen bonded to another hydrogen. If I was looking at this in terms of the electron clouds in the molecule, we would say that the distribution of the electrons is symmetrical, right? Because it's a nonpolar molecule. So there are my hydrogen nuclei. Here's my cloud of electrons. There is no dipole moment on this molecule. It's nonpolar. There's no positive or negative area. All of the electrons are evenly distributed around those two hydrogen atoms. Now, what if there was another hydrogen molecule next door or nearby? Because we know that molecules are always in motion, especially gas molecules, right? They're flying around all over the place. So if I have another H2 molecule next door, what would happen if these two molecules came near to one another? When they come near one another, the electrons in this molecule do not want to be near the electrons in this molecule. And so they disperse, they move. That's why it's called a dispersion force. The electrons in this electron cloud will all shift to one side. So like, let's say they shift to the left. So the cloud over here is gonna get a little bit bigger. So there are my nuclei. And over here, we got a little bit negative because the electrons ran over to this side of the molecule. And over here, the electrons became a little bit, or the side of the molecule, I'm sorry, became a little bit positive because the electrons shifted. The two electrons in this shared bond shifted to the left-hand side of the molecule, which means that in this molecule on the other side, the electrons are now going to shift towards that positive charge. So in this molecule, the left side is also going to get bigger. I'm not very good at drawing these things, you guys. There we go. So this side becomes a little bit negative, and this side becomes a little bit positive. There's this temporary dispersion of electrons when these two molecules come near one another. Now there is an area where some attraction can occur. Now this partially positive dipole can attract to this partially negative dipole. There's the attraction. That purple dotted line or pink dotted line that I just made right there, that is the dispersion force. It is a temporary attraction between these molecules. Now the word induced means made to have happened. Like if you um, are like a week past your due date um, to have your baby, the doctors will induce labor using a, um, a medicine called Pitocin to induce contractions in the uterus. So this dipole was induced by the fact that these two atoms came near one another. They were not polar already. They were nonpolar molecules that became polar when these atoms, I'm sorry, when these molecules came near one another. Now, as you guys can tell, I'm struggling to make something static look dynamic. So I want you to go and watch some of those review videos that I've posted to so you can see some nice animations of this dispersion force in action. Okay, so there's your description, there's your diagram. Now, all substances experience dispersion forces. Even if um, that molecule is polar, it will additionally feel some additional dispersion force when those atoms come near one another. So all molecules will experience dispersion forces. And when I say all, I mean all covalent molecules. These IMFs that we're referring to up here, you guys, maybe I should have said that up here, these are only for covalent molecules. Because we know that ionic compounds have a crystal lattice structure holding them together. We know that metals have a sea of electrons holding them together. 
what's holding together covalent compounds are these IMFs. That's another abbreviation that we use for intermolecular forces. Okay, so all substances will experience dispersion forces. Now, because they are temporary and they are only in play when these molecules are near to one another, these are the weakest of the three IMFs that we are going to discuss today. And next year, we'll talk about ways in which these forces can be made stronger. Okay, now let's talk dipole-dipole forces. Dipole-dipole forces are an attraction between permanent dipoles. in polar molecules. So the difference being here is these areas are already polar, or these molecules are already polar. There's already an attraction. I'm sorry, not an attraction. There's already an area of partial positive and partial negative charge. For example, what if instead of um, a hydrogen molecule, we had hydrochloric acid, a hydrogen to a chlorine? We know that this molecule is already polar. If I were to draw this molecule, I know that that chlorine is partially negative and the hydrogen is partially positive. This molecule is already polar on its own. It did not need to come near another molecule to get its electrons to shift and create a temporary dipole. So if I were to draw a hydrochloric acid molecule, my chlorine side of my molecule would already be partially negative. And my hydrogen is already partially positive. So if I had another HCl molecule next door or nearby in my sample, I know that my chlorine is negative and my hydrogen is positive. So again, the chlorine side of my molecule is going to be a little bit larger and partially negative. I left myself a little more room here to draw the attraction. I don't know why I drew them quite so far apart. Sorry about that. So here, you guys, we're going to have this attraction between the partially positive hydrogen on one molecule and the partially negative chlorine on the other. This is what we call a dipole-dipole force. And because this is created by a molecule that is already polar, or by the dipoles on an already polar molecule, in order to experience dipole-dipole forces, only polar molecules experience dipole-dipole forces. And it is stronger than dispersion in most cases. So it is of moderate strength. And again, we'll talk about you know, some exceptions to that and how all of these forces can be made stronger as well as their effects on properties. We'll talk about that next year. And then lastly is hydrogen bonding. Now I know that the word bonding is a bit of a misnomer, okay? It is not a bond in the sense of an atom being attracted to an atom. This is still an intermolecular attraction. Hydrogen bonding is a super strong dipole-dipole. And you're like, well, how do you get to be a super strong dipole-dipole? It is a super strong dipole-dipole attraction between a partially positive hydrogen on one molecule to a partially negative nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine that is bonded to hydrogen 
in another molecule. Okay, now I know that's a bit of a mouthful. Go ahead and pause if you need to write that down. Let's look at the most famous example of hydrogen bonding, and this occurs in water. So we know that water has this bent geometry. I think I'm just gonna draw the Lewis structure, you guys. I really stink at drawing clouds of electrons. So like, let's just go with our Lewis structure. All right, there we have it. We know that the oxygen really partially negative and the hydrogens really partially positive right because this is a polar bond pulling up towards that oxygen up towards that oxygen and we got those lone pairs up there we're gonna have a really negative area on this oxygen nitrogen oxygen and fluorine are the three most electronegative atoms on the periodic table so that means when they're bonded to hydrogen they're going to get a really big dipole moment because they're so electronegative well, what if we have another oxygen and water molecule next door? Lone pair, lone pair. Partially positive hydrogens, right? And my oxygen partially negative. The hydrogen bond is the attraction of this hydrogen, this partially positive hydrogen on one molecule, to the partially negative nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, in this case oxygen, that is also bonded to a hydrogen in a neighboring molecule. So like this attraction of the hydrogen to the oxygen, that right there is the hydrogen bond. And there's another one over here as well. This hydrogen to oxygen. Those right there are your hydrogen bonds. And water exhibits what we call perfect hydrogen bonding because there's like a one-to-one -one lineup. So for every one hydrogen you have, there's an oxygen with a lone pair on it. So you can see there's this perfect alignment of hydrogen to lone pair, hydrogen to lone pair. And it makes for a very, very, very strong intermolecular attraction. Water has a very high boiling point, very high surface tension. You observed some of these properties in the lab last week. Okay, but the hydrogen bond is not the bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen in the water. That's just the covalent single bond. The hydrogen bond is the attraction of the neighboring hydrogen to the neighboring oxygen. So in order to experience hydrogen bonding, you have to have a polar molecule where the hydrogen is bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. It's like a super beefed up dipole-dipole moment or dipole-dipole attraction because that dipole moment is so strong. And this is our strongest of our three IMFs. Now, these IMFs, while they do affect properties and melting point and boiling point, and I've gone on and on about how strong hydrogen bonds are, they are way, way weaker than a covalent bond itself. And they are way, way weaker than ionic bonds and the attraction of the sea of electrons in metals. So these IMFs are, are certainly the weakest of the forces holding together samples in a substance but they're important nonetheless. Great job, you guys. We are done with bonding, and we get to move on to reactions, one of my favorite units.